welcome to a half hour of Mind Webs. Short stories from the worlds of speculative fiction. This is Michael Hansen with a Mind Web story that comes from a collection edited by Groff Conklin called 13 Great Stories of Science Fiction. This is Allegory by William T. Powers. The research guidance center was always busy near the first of the month, for at that time the allotments for research funds were computed and distributed in the beginning of the first week's run of guidance checks was starting in the big computers in the sub-basements. On one Monday morning, the third of the month, John Mark received a communication that had a considerable effect on his stability rating for some two weeks, after which, of course, it didn't matter. Mark was sitting at his desk in the incoming office coding requests to initiate research. His task was mainly routine, consisting of translating various types of requests into language the computers could understand. Only one out of 50 requests required any real thinking and no more than one out of a thousand called for any kind of personal contact. His mind, comfortably locked into a smooth and ordered pattern, was stirred only by events of highly unusual nature. He stared, big-eyed, at the application that had arrested his fingers over the quarter keys. Name, Henry Norris. Address, WJCHN 10110011101001. Nature of projected research, application of anti-gravity device to various forms of transportation. Confusion stirred dangerously in Mark's solar plexus. His mind, well trained to handle this sensation, searched quickly through the possibilities and handed up an answer. Mark smiled. Carefully, he read pencil two words in the application and wrote in two more so that it read, Invention of anti-gravity device for various forms of transportation. Then he stamped the application, rejected science physical, and data not subject to rational investigation. And he mailed it back to WJCHN 10110011001001. Four days later, he got it back with a letter. Dear sir, I have received the enclosed application returned with the wording changed and a rejection stamp across the middle of it. Naturally, the way you have reworded my application, I can see why you rejected it. However, I wish to apply for permission to apply an invention, not to develop it. Therefore, I am returning another application worded properly and wish to have slightly more accurate handling this time. Mark wondered why the chill went up his spine. Of course, there was nothing to worry about, but, well, that was it. There was nothing to worry about. And the sigh, he quoted the application and sent it to Science Physical. By the time he came back from lunch, the rejected form with the usual explanatory letter was lying on his desk. Out of habit, he scanned it. Dear sir, your application is being rejected by the Department of Physical Sciences for the following reasons. One, no anti-gravity device exists. Two, the approved laws of physical science do not allow for the existence of anti-gravity devices. Owing to certain data too complex to go into in this letter, we cannot allow computations for determining the probability of the development of such a device to occupy the services of the Physical Sciences Computing Department. We suggest that you refer to... And there followed a long list of library codes, enumerating books and papers concerning anti-gravity, and a final admonition to become more versed in the laws of physical science. Mark knew that part, so he skipped it. As a matter of form, he added the penciled note to the letter, apologizing for the initial mishandling, and sent the envelope and its contents off to the mailing chutes. Four days later, there was a letter from WJCHN 10110011101001 lying on the desk. Dear Sir, I have received your rejection of my application. Since nobody at RGC seems to be able to read, I shall appear personally at your office a week from the date of mailing this letter. In order to avoid any further contact with whomever it is on your staff that is illiterate, 
I shall bring a working model of my device. And perhaps, by drawing suitable colored pictures and limiting my vocabulary to the eight-year-old level, I shall be able to make you understand that I have an anti-gravity device that I wish to apply to various forms of transportation, and that I do not want my application handled by chimpanzees who happen to know how to type. If the computers say that the device does not exist, that is their privilege. But what the computers say seems to have very little to do with reality. I'll see you next Tuesday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Or if that is beyond you, roughly halfway between lunch and quitting time. Sincerely, H. Norris. An extremely uncomfortable feeling swept over Mark at the phrase, what the computers say seems to have very little to do with reality. For a moment he considered calling medical, but reconsidered when he thought that the poor fellow was probably quite frustrated and the letter was, after all, a form of catharsis. It might be amusing to see his device anyway. On the way home that evening, Mark happened to look up as the evening jet from Sydney whistled overhead. It always went over about the time he was waiting for the 40830. And usually he just accepted it as part of the trip home. But today he watched it out of sight. Disturbing little thoughts stirring in his brain. Supposing the jet had gone overhead without making that seltzer bottle noise on anti-gravity beams, would he have noticed? He felt sure he would have, and that everyone else would have too. He could just picture the mass uneasiness, feel the surging emotions. That evening at supper, he was unusually silent, and the next morning his wife had to go talk it over with the family psych. It had been quite a shock to her, for she had been planning exactly how she was going to tell him about the letter from her sister, which in itself was an unexpected and therefore unpleasant event. When John had failed to spend three quarters of an hour reading the paper after she had set the dishes to wash and had turned on the news broadcast instead, her whole pattern had been disrupted. John himself even seemed a little upset that morning, but he refused to go to the psych with her. By the time Monday morning came around again, and then Tuesday morning, John Mark had pretty well forgotten that he was going to have a visitor. His wife had fully recovered, having found that she could make up for the insecurity by making a few purchases recommended by the psych and repeating phrases G36992 and 9973 several times to herself before she went to sleep. She had used those particular passages from the auto-correction book before with equally fine results. Just about lunchtime, Mark remembered the phrase, What the computers say has very little to do with reality. It startled him, and he began to get confused, wondering why on earth he would think a thing like that. Fortunately, there was a health view machine nearby, and after watching his favorite actress for a few moments, he was quite calm again. He ate lunch and returned calmly to his desk, where he resumed the coding. Roughly halfway between lunch and quitting time, he remembered that Norris was due any moment. What made him remember was Norris, who walked through the door precisely at two o'clock, are you Mark? He had a briefcase in his hand upon which Mark's eyes fastened helplessly. John Mark, yes, uh, how do you do? Remembering his manners, he waved at the visitor's chair. Uh, sit down. Well, sir, is there some difficulty I can help you iron out? <laughs> Nuts. You no more care about helping me out than you care to slit your own throat. I brought the model. Norris never questioned that Mark knew who he was, and Mark did not even think of asking. Well, where is it? Norris paused and looked at Mark with what might have been pity for an instant. Then he shrugged and gave the briefcase a shove toward Mark. It sailed silently through the air in a straight line toward Mark's head. There was, apparently, nothing holding it up. Mark stared uncomprehendingly at the approaching brown rectangle. His mind kept supplying briefcase after briefcase, all leaving the one in the air and following the neat parabola to the floor, but the real one kept demanding his attention. Something began whispering in his mind, becoming momentarily more desperate. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. You will fall. You will fall. Section 356, paragraph 9, subhead A, gravity is... I swear to uphold the tenets of security and welfare. Remember, son, there's always a computer to turn to. 
What the computers say seems to have very little to do with reality. And then his hands reached up involuntarily and received the briefcase, and he felt it for an instant and fainted. Are you going to do that again? No, he said and picked himself out of the visitor's chair where Norris had evidently put him and drank the water that Norris held out to him. Mark's face burned with shame, and he felt terribly depressed. Do you believe me now? Get get out, please. That's not after 18 years and two weeks. I am going to get this fog-bound outfit to grant me permission to apply my device to various forms of transportation. Or I am going to know the reason why. But, but it's absolutely impossible. Uh, there's no possible way that you could develop an anti-gravity device. The laws of physics are... <laughs> Look, friend. Who made up those laws of physics? Why, nobody. The, the computers deduced them from the basic facts of the universe. And who said that those were the basic facts of the universe? Oh, why, that, that's ridiculous. The basic facts are the basic facts. It doesn't matter who discovered them. They're still basic. Norris pointed silently to the briefcase. It was drifting between the desk and the water cooler, being accelerated slowly by the slight draft from the air conditioner. Mark looked only for an instant and then averted his eyes. That, uh, that is a very disturbing illusion, and, and you know that illusions are illegal. I request you to explain it at once, rationally. You can't get out, can you? I, I can't convince you that there's no trick, no illusion. Well, why should I even try to let you? There's no point in it. It can't happen, so why should you try to convince me? I don't understand. What? Don't you understand? You can see this. What is there to understand about? It? But I know what I can see. Let me state it as simply as I can. In this briefcase, I have a device which nullifies the attraction of the Earth. It is adjusted so that it exactly balances out the weight of the briefcase. There is nothing inside the briefcase but the device... And there is nothing else holding up the briefcase. Therefore, I have an anti-gravity device. Furthermore, I wish to make some money from it, as I have practically starved my fool head off for 18 years and two weeks working on the silly thing. It no longer impresses me. All I care about now is being extremely wealthy, so I do not have to starve while I am inventing my force field. Do you understand that. But you cannot invent a force field either. According to the laws of physics, there can be the no... The laws of physics again. I'm not going to throw away my plans just because some bollocks up computer says I can't see something obvious. I could have you thrown in prison for that. You shouldn't say things like that. The laws of physics are all that preserve our sanity toward the real universe. There's no other way of looking at reality that won't lead to psychosis. You know that as well as I do. It's one of the basic facts of life. And I suppose the computers figured that out for you, too. And did the computers also tell you to believe everything the computers said? Now, who do you suppose told you to believe the computers when they computed that you should believe them? The computers? Ah, nuts! Uh, uh, nuts is an archaic expression. You need a trip to your psych. You ought to go right away. Your, your mind is in danger. Stop it, please. You are destroying my faith in everything I believe in. Why do you have faith in it? Because you were told to have faith in it? Do you ever think for yourself? Oh, you're psychotic. Mark reached for a buzzer on his desk. Norris caught his wrist. That won't do any good. I can rate AAA on any psychometric. I am not psychotic, and neither are you. The only trouble is that you've accepted a very limited reality, and you've done it because you're afraid not to. Why is it so painful for you to look at this? Mark took a deep breath and got a grip on his tottering sense of reality. Quite carefully, he turned to the only source of comfort he could find... The law of gravity needs no proof. It has been tested thousands of times by competent authority, and it has been proven to be just what the computers say it is. 
mutual attraction between any two material bodies. We can consider the subject of the law of gravity to be closed. No further data is needed at this time by the computer, and the computer is so designed as to indicate when more data is needed to keep the system self-consistent and in accord with the real universe. That sentence appeared in nearly the same form, although with different contexts in nearly every section in the book of all knowledge. Mark had completed his reading of the book of all knowledge years ago and remembered only the basic principles of it. But he knew that somewhere was the knowledge and the logic that would prove this incredible man with his incredible toy to be a faker, an illusionist, a psychotic. If he could only remember more. In the midst of his whirling confusion, he had a sudden inspiration. Look, Look, I suppose it is unfair of me to doubt my eyes, but there might be one thing you haven't thought of. What do you suppose the other departments will say? <laughs> After all, this is a rather revolutionary device, and they should be consulted. But this device is concerned purely with the laws of physics and mechanics. It has nothing to do directly with the other departments. You know that nobody asking permission to apply an invention has to submit to the approval of the whole RGC. Uh, you yourself said that this device does not seem to be covered by the recognized data in the Department of Physics. And since it doesn't, we must investigate all the data and make as fair a decision as possible. All right. Well, go ahead. But, but remember, I'll be right here to make sure you tell them what you've seen. Tell them it doesn't fall. Mark went to the intercom unit and punched the psych button. He said, I, I have a man here who says he's invented an anti-gravity device. No. Uh, wait a moment. Uh, he has brought a briefcase with him that floats in the air. Yeah. No apparent support. Uh, quite interesting, but... Well, there's nothing in the laws of physics to justify it. I can't really throw the fellow out for owning it, but what do you think about granting permission to apply it to various forms of transportation? Norris moved closer and caught the answer. Absolutely not. I don't even have to put it in the computer. Anti-gravity would cause widespread insecurity that would wreck the system. Can't go around destroying reality like that, you know. Tell the fellow he'd better hide the thing and forget it. Tell him he can come up here for a little talk if he wants to. Must have been quite traumatic inventing a thing like that. Is he there now? Yes, I'm here. What do you mean it must have been quite traumatic? I enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, are you trying to tell me I can't do it? Well, if you put it that way, sir, yes. That is exactly what we'll have to do. Uh, of course, you can appeal this decision and we'll feed the data into the computer. However, I can tell you that the... Psych section computer is set to reject automatically anything that interferes with the decisions of the physical sciences computer. I'm afraid you'd better go spend a few weeks with a Tri-D health view machine. Or turn your talents to something more productive. After all, there, there is practically an infinite number of undiscovered connections among the data in the book of all knowledge. The computers only know what could be found there. Fascinating things. Oh, all right, that's all. Oh, if physics changed their decision about anti-gravity, would you change yours? Uh, well, probably, but of course, we'd have to check with medical, too. After all, the physical health of our people is just as important as their mental health these days. Medical was quick and to the point. They happened to contact a man with a good memory. Oh, we've had these calls before, Mark. The decision is straightforward. It seems that a Dr. Summers, about 50 years ago, fed the data into a computer just to see what would happen and found that no human being could withstand the stresses of anti-gravity flight. Plays hob with the endocrine balance, the, the, the blood pressure, re respiration rate, and so on. <laughs> Anyhow, we have, we have a lot of data from Psych that, would, that, that, that says that the uh, introduction of a non-physical thing like that would, would immediately produce mass psychosis. <laughs> what did Commerce say? Uh, I haven't called him yet. Well, thanks. Uh, see you later, Jim. Then Mark punched another button. Yeah, yeah. This is this is commerce. What, what sort of thing? 
Well, he says he's got an anti-gravity device. And it's in this briefcase that's floating all over the room. <laughs> Holy cow. It gives me the creeps to think about it. No, no, I don't think we've ever computed anything like that before. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, the channel you need's open right now. I'll be right back. After a wait of several minutes, the voice resumed, shaken. Uh, 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 listen, you'd better confiscate that gadget, Mark. If it ever got out, the whole system would go right down to a security rating with zeros after the decimal point. It's poison. Uh, the computer isn't even set up to handle a new form of transportation. The fuel and loading capacities figure in and a lot of other factors. I've read in anti-gravity as a fact, and the, the charts came out looking all bloody. Uh, no go, Mark. Norris didn't bother to reply to that one. Mark noticed the silence and asked, Well, you want me to call communications and law and transport and philosophy? No. You absolutely can't see, can you? Well, it's all perfectly plain. The device just does not belong in this world. Even if it were real, it would still be the worst possible thing that could happen. You know what you're trying to do to the system, don't you? I know. Now, look, don't, don't take it so hard. I know these things seem awfully important at the time, but you'll forget about it soon enough. Why, there are thousands of things that are desperately needed, and anyone who could create an illusion as convincing as that could certainly make all the money he wants producing devices that the computers will permit. <laughs> You're just all caught up in this thing, and all you need to do is get away from it for a while. After all, 18 years. Yes, 18 years and two weeks. <laughs> are you really convinced... That what you are saying is supposed to make me feel better? Norris, you are attacking the basic human drive, the urge to be secure, to be safe, to be taken care of. If you take away people's desire for security, then you've left them nothing to live for. Don't you see that? Have you tried not wanting security? Don't be ridiculous. Why should I deliberately drive myself psychotic? How do you know you're not? Mark stared at him a long moment. He knew that that was an old, old gimmick. But suddenly he could not remember what the logical answer to it was supposed to be. Norris, watching him closely, sighed and began. <sighs> Why do you believe the computers? Well, because they give me my security. Why do you need security? Security is a basic drive. There's no why to it. Mark was staring out the window feeling strangely caught in something, in some web of thought that Norris was weaving. How do you know that it's basic? You know, the computers say it is. All the computers say so. Who decided that the computers would say that? Nobody. It's a basic fact. How do you know it's a basic fact? The computers say it is. Who decided the computers would say it is? Nobody. Uh, the computers. I, I don't know. How can you find out? I don't want to find out. Why not? The computers will provide an answer if I need it. Who said that you have to go to the computers for an answer? The computers? Why don't you leave me alone? Why should I leave you alone? Get out of here. You're trying to drive me crazy. What do you mean by crazy? You're crazy. You're trying to destroy the reality of the computer. Why shouldn't I destroy the reality of the computer? It's all in the book of all knowledge. I don't want to answer any more questions. Who wrote the book of all knowledge? The computers. The computers. You know all these things. Why are you doing this? Please get out of here. What are you afraid of having happen? Are you starting to think? Look, uh, please, get out or I'll have you arrested. Norris stood up, gathering his briefcase to him. You will continue thinking about this. Mark tried to think, but all that came to his mind was the series of questions and answers each time nagging at something in his brain as though something there was whispering... It's so obvious, so obvious. It lasted all through that night and all the next day and on into the night after that. 
About two o'clock in the morning, after he had used the last of his strength in trying to sleep and trying to think of the lake shores and the mountains and the health views and trying to be unconscious and trying to die, he began to weep. They took him to the asylum a week later. He was strangely calm as they propelled him toward the gates. He watched silently as they filled out the dozens of forms, the assignments, the agreements, the legal trivia. As they approached the great gray building, he began to smile. And as he waited in the ante room to be checked in, he chuckled. Walking through the long series of locked and barred doors, he guffawed. And while the attendant spun the dials on the last and most ponderous door, he held his sides and roared. That was over soon, and he took a deep breath, like a man who has swum a long way underwater. When the door swung wide... He gasped. Norris looked up from the workbench, gestured at the huge, gleaming laboratory, the scurrying, white-coated men, the racks of equipment, the panels studded with jacks and meters. And Norris said, grinning, Welcome to the loony bin. Volume 13, Great Stories of Science Fiction, a collection edited by Groff Conklin. You've heard Allegory, written by William T. Powers. I'm Michael Hansen. Reading with me were Jim Fleming and Cliff Roberts. Technical operation for this program by Dan Schmidt. Mindwebs is a production of WHA Radio in Madison, a service of University of Wisconsin Extension. Thank you.